Hi boys and girls, welcome to Stories today at the library. And we welcome Miss Erin from Madison Elementary School as the Madison Librarian. Hi guys, how are you doing? Happy summer. Are you all excited that distance learning is over? Whoo, we got through that one, didn't we? It might have been kind of rough, but look at all the great things you learned how to do on your iPads. I bet you guys are so smart and ahead of the game for next year. Proud of every single one of you for sticking to it, doing those lessons, learning how to navigate that iPad, and sometimes even teaching mom and dad. Because we do different things at school than you do at home. Look how smart you are. You're awesome. Today, we're going to read a couple of stories from my favorite place in the entire world, the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois. All of you Madison Cardinals know how often we talk about the Field Museum and everything that we have to see and do there. We do activities from the Field Museum. So we're going to read a couple of stories today about my favorite specimen in the entire world. Madison Cardinals, you know who that is. It's Sue the T-Rex. Sue is amazing. Sue has a brand new space in the Field Museum upstairs. Sue is no longer in the Great Hall. Her friend Maximo took that space over. Maximo is a titanosaur. He's huge, 122 feet long. So Sue needed a brand new house. Sue moved upstairs. Now my Madison Cardinal friends know that in our library, we have two little mice friends named Hunkamunka and Mrs. Brisby. And they like to spend their day rolling around in balls and checking out all the books in the library. And the story that we're gonna start with today is about a mouse meeting Sue the T-Rex for the very first time. My two favorite things in one book. Oh my gosh. All right, we're gonna read this book that you actually can buy online. You can actually buy it in the Field Museum in Chicago, but this is called The Field Mouse and the Dinosaur Named Sue. It is written by Jan Wall, illustrated by Bob Doucette, and it's published by Scholastic Books. Thank you, Scholastic Books, for letting us do this online and bringing these books to all of our kiddos. So you can see Little Mouse Friend, Big Dinosaur, Big Museum. How does that mouse get in that museum, I wonder? Hmm, I think we're about to find out. Now, we can't have mice live in the museum because they chew a lot of stuff. And you wouldn't want a dinosaur bone being chewed on by a mouse. That would not be good. All right, little mouse. Oh, she's sleeping. Early one morning, field mouse heard strange noises outside his burrow. Some loud, some soft. Scratch, scratch, chip, and bang. His, mouth, his house had a roof made of an old bone. Field mouse peered into the hot day. People with shovels, scrapers, and picks dug into the bluff above. Carefully, slowly. Oh my, cried a young woman. Look at this beautiful thing. She showed the others a bone like his roof. Old bones lay all over the place. They were no good for chewing on. They were like rock, in fact, they were rock. Okay, so he can't chew on it, so that's a good thing. Because he would probably break his teeth. That would be bad. That day and the next and the next and the next, diggers kept digging. Field Mouse had to see what was happening. In the afternoon, he wished to take a nap. He scurried back to the home he had known his whole life. Now, these people are scientists, guys. These are called paleontologists and they study fossilized dinosaur bones. They have to find the fossil in the rock and they have to dig it out and then put it together like a giant puzzle and see which dinosaur it belonged to. It can be a really dirty job. And look at little field mouse, doesn't want to get next to all the big people with the axes. I don't blame the little field mouse. When he got there, he saw a terrible sight. His burrow was torn open, the roof was gone. They took my bone away. Now I must find it, he decided. Packing boxes lay here and there. Old, old, old bones were wrapped in burlap and placed gently in wooden boxes. A worker put a cheese sandwich down on the edge of a box. The cheese sandwich fell in. Field Mouse thought his bone might just be in that box too. He climbed in, he sniffed and poked, but he could not find his roof. 
but he found a sandwich, so it's a positive thing. Suddenly, a lid was put on the box. It grew black as pitch. The box was lifted onto a truck, and the truck drove off. At first, Field Mouse lay on the sandwich. His stomach rumbled from hunger. It kept him awake. The cheese smelled wonderful. Well, he decided, I'll try eating this. It was wonderful, but he missed his home. So he's taking an adventure with a cheese sandwich. Maybe we should try that one day. The box was taken to a place called Chicago, where they had a huge building. The building was called the Field Museum. The box was put on a shelf in a cool place in a special room. So here's our museum and look, here comes the truck. Now that special room is called Dinosaur Storage and it's huge. I've been in there, lots of big bones. Even a Mosasaur. Mm -hmm. If you've seen Jurassic Park, a Mosasaur. One morning, the lid on the box was opened. Field Mouse jumped out. On tables lay more bits and pieces of old bones, some large, some tiny. A man was studying them and didn't see him. Field Mouse looked and looked for his roof. He flicked his tail and ran when he heard voices. Sue, mumble, mumble, said one. Sue, mumble, said another. What is Sue? wondered the mouse. He squeezed through an opening in the wall and out of the room. Ooh, wonder who Sue is. Oh, wow, look at that big space. He scampered up onto a ledge, searching for his bone. He saw something so tall it reached to the sky of the hall. It was Field Mouse's first dinosaur. He, it had no skin or fur. Down below him, people gazed at the critter. They were small as insects. He grew dizzy whew, and felt lost. Imagine how big that dinosaur is, this little tiny mouse. And that's not even Sue. Field mouse hid until nighttime. Then he crawled up to a window. Beyond, many lights of the city twinkled. Far off was a lake. It made him thirsty. He found water in a plastic cup someone left on the floor. He tipped it over and drank. Now, if you find a cup of water on the floor in a museum, don't do that. Just let the mouse do it. You drink from your own bottle that you bring. When visitors were gone, Field Mouse was free to run. He saw colors through another glass window. He didn't know it, but he was looking at Chicago as it was. 410 million years ago. There were plants, corals, snails, and shells. He scratched to get in. Do you think that that ancient creature is going to let him in? Do you predict that that is what would happen? Do you think that he could let him in? <gasps> it's a good prediction. Field Mouse soon grew tired and pushed himself into a small space in the wall. There it was dark and he could close his eyes and remember home. When he awoke, he saw a man polishing the floor with a machine that whirred loudly and spun. Field Mouse almost got pulled into it. He wiggled and jumped. He raced down the length of the hall and passed two elephants. He ran and ran and ran until his legs wouldn't go anymore. Then he collapsed in a corner whew, and fell asleep. It's a lot of stuff for a little mouse. In the daytime, if no visitors were near, Field Mouse crawled up and peered into a special place where people seemed very, very busy. They scraped at bones big and little or poured plaster on others. They were as careful as the diggers who found the bones had been. They looked odd because they wore masks. We see people wear masks nowadays, don't we? It's the same type of thing. Dust flew in the air as they took tiny stones away from old bones. There was a lot to explore. Every room was different, and he found more people working on bones. Maybe one bone was his roof. He kept searching. Now think for a second and make a prediction. Do you think he's gonna find his roof? Hmm, I wonder. It's a very persistent little mouse. Mostly field mouse hid behind walls. It was best to come out only at night. He learned to tunnel from one room into another, squeezing into the tiniest crack. One day he entered a great high room with palms, biggest trees, 
giant dragonflies big as birds. This was Chicago 300 million years ago. He sniffed and sniffed. Nothing was real, nothing to nibble on. He missed his home. Field Mouse felt he would never find his bone. There were so many strange creatures all around him. He liked to look at Dimitrudon. The eyes were empty holes, but seemed to stare at him. Do you see? These would be his eyes up here. He began to explore Apatosaurus. Its tail alone was 30 feet long. The critters became his friends. They had so many bones. Field Mouse thought Triceratops was scary. Did these critters have fur like him? Were they lizards? Field Mouse found it was fun to climb up on their backs and slide down to the floor. He took naps where he could, but wished he had a cozy spot of his own. Now remember, Triceratops has three horns. One, two, three. And Dimetrudon has this great big sail of bones across his back. One day, to his surprise, the giant critter in the Great Hall was gone. Men and women kept going back and forth. They were putting up something to keep the crowds away. And look, it says Sue. Hmm, who's the Sue person, I wonder? Field Mouse still had not found a home. To cheer himself up, he went to the cafe. He found a scrap of tasty, excellent cake. He was hearing, Sue this, Sue that. His ears rang with Sue. What was it? Then one morning, there it was, all put together. The Sue they talked about. The biggest T-Rex in the world. She was 67 million years old. Of course, he didn't know that. A lot of people stood in front admiring her. She had peculiar, short, stubby arms. Poor thing, thought Field Mouse. How did she ever pick up a piece of cheese? Or cake, I would pick up cake. But these are the little stubby arms he's talking about right here. Look how big this dinosaur is compared to this little tiny mouse. And look, everybody wants to see Sue. Later that night, the hall lay empty, except for Sue and the Field Mouse. He walked up to each foot he climbed on her toes and crawled up a leg. Slowly, he climbed up, searching. In coming down, he stopped in the middle of the other foot. His bone! His very own bone! He chattered to Sue. She kept silent. Under his bone, it was dark and cool and safe. A fine place for a secret nest. He made it with bits of paper, smooth and round. Maybe Sue had been a terrible, angry hunter once, crushing through forests of tall magnolia or oak trees, but now she was quiet and gentle. Field Mouse was sure she was singing a soft song. Under the foot, he dreamed a happy dream. He was home. The end. The story of Sue. So we learned that Sue is a T-Rex. And the reason everyone loves the T-Rex named Sue is because Sue is the most complete T-Rex in the entire world. The Chicago Museum has 90% of Sue's complete skeleton. And you can see Sue if you travel to Chicago, or you can actually go online and look at pictures of Sue and see exactly what this animal looks like in person. Do you like that story? I love the story. Poor little field mouse. He found his bone, just as we predicted, and he made new friends, which is great. What a wonderful thing. Even for us nowadays, we can make new friends wherever we go. Now, fossils are cool, right? Yeah, fossils are cool. Mrs. Blake typically travels with fossils. Madison Cardinals know this. A couple of us have worked with fossils. So I brought some for you guys to see today. Now, this one is from Wyoming. This is a fish. Isn't this cool? You can see the full tail, all the bones in the fish, the head. This came from a place called Green River. They still find fish and all different kinds of animals from Green River, Wyoming every single day. Remember, those scientists were called what? 
paleontologist. Very good. Now, this one I just found the other day. It was actually the garden center here in Indiana. And yes, I found a fossil. Oh my gosh. And I had to bring it home. This is fossilized coral. Now, 400 million years ago, remember, they had tall tropical trees in this area. We were underwater. We were part of an ocean. Did you know that? Pretty cool. Fossilized coral. I love this because you can actually see the coral structure underneath. And then it has been polished where you can see how the coral formed on the top. Fossilized coral. Now, some of you have seen and watched programs about sharks. In Madison, we did an entire program about the megalodon, the biggest shark in the ocean. Now, this is an actual megalodon tooth. This would probably have been a baby because there are other megalodon teeth that are about the size of my hand, but this one would be a young shark and you can see this will be the gum line and the tooth is actually coming out. And if I rub my finger along it, it has serrated edges like a knife. So this is how when they hunt, they would actually tear and eat. But you can actually still feel the ridges on this tooth. Isn't that neat? Millions of years old and you can hold it in your hand. This is another megalodon. And this megalodon tooth is the exact same, but this would be a baby megalodon. So if you think about a megalodon shark, a big female would be about 60 feet long. So a baby megalodon would be about the size of the largest great white shark that we've had found so far, which is about 20 feet long. Mm -hmm. Baby, baby megalodon. Pretty cool, right? Okay. I think we have time for one more story. All right, we're gonna go back to Chicago. We're gonna travel back to the museum. And this time we had, the field mouse had an adventure. They have insects there, live insects. And they have a scientist there that loves to study insects. And they wrote a book about all the adventures of the insects in the museum. This is called Rosie the Tarantula. This is Rosie. And a True Adventure in Chicago's Field Museum. Illustrations by Peggy McNamara. Peggy is actually an artist in residence at the Field Museum. And a lot of the artwork that you see there is by Miss Peggy. She has beautiful watercolors. This was written by Katie McNamara. Yes, mother and daughter. And it's published by Northwestern University Press. Thank you, Northwestern. They are a university up in Evanston, Illinois. In the book bespattered office of a scientist named Jim, here's Jim, at a natural history museum that was like a home to him, there lived a terrarium all woodsy and cozy, a pink-toed tarantula that everyone called Rosie. Bespattered is a really fancy word meaning clutter, like my office. Most tarantulas, as you know, live in burrows or trees and feast on cicadas, caterpillars, and bees, small birds, frogs, and beetles, and sometimes some mice. Indeed, some great big spiders find lizards quite nice. These eight-legged eaters devour bed bugs too, saving you from scritchy scratchies and a bed that's a zoo. But Rosie, our heroine, ate crickets most often, which she used spidery spittle to sweeten and soften. Old Jim kindly fed her every couple of days as he watched her and carefully studied her ways and brought his dear Rosie into the museum with other live creatures so the children could see him. Look at Rosie's meeting people. Rosie helped Jim teach kids about eight-legged beasts and millipedes once thought to have thousands of feet. Her glimpses, however, of Grand Stanley Field Hall made Rosie imagine how far she might crawl. Now she has to go in a box because you don't want a big old giant spider crawling all over the place. It kind of freaks people out. Male tarantulas, that means boys, she knew who roamed far to find wives tended to live sadly much shorter lives. But Rosie craved travel much more than romance, longing to wander, make discoveries, and dance. To learn about creatures besides Jim and her peers and explore the museum with her sensory hairs. The kids in the great hall moved too fast for study and Rosie felt timid around everybody. Can you imagine a spider who's shy? 
Crozier's. So she toured the field's hallways, entered its huts, and crept through the back rooms full of feathers and guts. These scientists studied the nature they cherished and gave lifelike appearances to beasts who had perished. They're all there to study. They were so lifelike that early one night, a great skinless rodent gave Rosie a fright. It wasn't a mouse, which she'd gladly have munched, like an elegant spidery lady who lunched. It was the mouse's cousin, the capybara to be exact, whose skeleton caused Rosie to fearfully react. Many lifeless beasts caught her quite by surprise as collections of bones are stuffed creatures with eyes. Or a stonefish staring out from a fluid-filled jar packed in with his friends like clowns in a car. These are specimen jars and this is where scientists put their specimens to study. Beside these damp fishies, some more dry bones lay, but Rosie imagined them swimming away. For she knew that although these fish weren't alive, scientists' studies of them would help others thrive. That's why they put them in jars. Yes, Jim had explained that to the children a lot, as he balanced sweet Rosie upon his bald spot. So she kept this in mind as she reached the next room, dashing past a custodian wielding a broom. Whoa, look out, Rosie. There she found eggs that had helped scientists see how shells thinned and birds died when we used DDT. Shell studies had led to the insect sprays ban, marking the moment when conservation began. DDT is a very powerful insecticide and it hurts other things, so this is a good thing that we study it so we can help birds. These eggs that enabled more birds to sing and helped humans prevent a feared silent spring prompted Rosie to picture live birds up in flight soaring past the museum in shimmering light. I love that Rosie imagines things. Such visions calmed Rosie when stillness brought bloom, like when tag birds lay lifeless simply pinned to their tomb. For the tags told the story of earth and its plenty. Yes, old Rosie knew this at the ripe age of 20. <gasps> She's 20 years old, that's old for a spider. So when Rosie happened upon a vat, dead, a vat of dead frogs, she imagined the gator who might have snatched them from logs. She herself might have chomped one, but they'd met another fate. Rosie could empathize with the prey that she ate, for she herself had escaped from a wasp known as Hawk in her wild pre-gym days when she'd gone for a walk. Someone tried to eat Rosie. How precious life is, she thought, seeing in glass, reflections of culture, nature, the past. Vases and totems made with natural supplies, mirrored polyp built corals before her bright eyes. Crafted by man or smooshy sea creatures, these objects surprised her with their similar features. A jeweler works wonders with crystal and stone, but what can compare to nature alone? Time passes, pressures mount, and look what gets made. Shiny pieces of earth in a dazzling parade. By contrast, a seed makes an art less eternal, thought Rosie, who now felt quite maternal. She's going and seeing rocks. Still, she gazed upon drawers of fine future flowers, sensing she might have her own superpowers. Look at everything that she's seeing in this museum. She felt like the Buddha, serene in his pose, as a creature impulse within her arose. So back to her office and to Jim she proceeded to build a web hammock, just what she needed. But first she would dance like a bold blessed beast, enjoying immensely the earth's gorgeous feasts, then reflect with friend Jim on all they could see, the abundance of all that has been and will be, and the wonder of being as we are in this minute, together loving life right while we are in it. Look at, she gets to sit with Jim. Good adventure, Miss Rosie. You guys keep reading, keep discovering, keep creating wonder in those fabulous brains and asking questions. Have a terrific summer. Hope you enjoyed visiting the museum with me. Feel free to ask any questions that I like. If you see me around town, I always has a possible in my pocket. And I will see you, Madison Cardinals, in August. I'm so proud of all of you. Have a great summer. Thank you, Miss Erin, for reading.